Peter Adamson, and you're listening to the History of Philosophy podcast, brought to you with the support of the Philosophy Department at King's College London and the LMU in Munich, online at www.historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode will be an interview about the relation between Byzantine philosophy and philosophy in Latin Christendom with Michele Trizio, who is Research Fellow at the University of Bari. Hi, Michele. Hi, Peter. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you. The first question I have is about the knowledge of Latin in the Byzantine realm. The scholars of Latin Christendom are famous for mostly not knowing Greek, with some exceptions like William of Moabeke and others who translated from Greek into Latin. Is the reverse true in Byzantium so that we can assume that knowledge of Latin was very rare? Yes, it is. Let's say that from late antiquity on, uh, just as in the Latin West, the knowledge of Greek slowly disappears. Also in the East, there are less and less people knowing Latin. There is one exception in the sense that uh, they needed people knowing Latin because of the Justinian Code of Law. And they knew people, they, they needed people to, to be able to, to understand and, uh, and speak Latin. But, uh, from, from the 7th, 8th century, also this uh, tiny evidence disappeared. Is that because they just translate all the legal yes, works into yes. Greek? The, the interesting thing is that they kept calling, uh, the study of law, the, the science of the Italians. That means the science of the Latins, as if it's not something which is the authentically Byzantine. And were they even interested in Latin texts? I mean, did they regret that they couldn't read these things? Very late. I, there is one episode which is uh, really interesting. In late 14th century, they learned about Thomas Aquinas and they translated Thomas Aquinas in Latin. The first reaction was, wow, these people knew Aristotle very so well. So in 14th century, they had no idea that there were scholars in the West working and on Aristotle and on Greek philosophy. They were actually surprised then. Exactly. So you have the idea of two worlds apart. It's amazing because that means that the Latin speaking world knew more about the Arabic speaking world than the Eastern part of the former Roman Empire knew about the Western part. Exactly. That's really astonishing. Uh, What about much earlier Latin writing figures? And in particular, what we might call Latin patristic authors. Just to take the most obvious example, Augustine. Weren't Augustine's works to some extent known in Byzantium? Very, very late. Only in late 13th century. Actually, they knew who Augustine was because they knew he was a Nero, or again, I mean, a Nero of the, uh, a theological Nero who fought against heresies. But they didn't know his writings. And, uh, in late, only in late 13th century, they translated Augustine's De Trinitate. And uh, they didn't translate and uh, know the confessions, for example. Uh, other works which were known and translated by the same translator who translated actually Augustine's De Trinitate were Boetius, the Consolazione Philosophia, and Cicero's The Somnium Scipionis, and uh, with, the, with the commentary by Macrobius. Okay. Yeah, that's the dream of yes, Scipio exactly. in English, right? Okay, so they know a little bit about Augustine, they know Boethius's Consolation, and they know... A little bit of Cicero and yes. Macrobius, so very yes. little. Very late, little and late. And so they actually knew less about the Latin tradition than the Latin tradition knew about the Greeks, because if you look at a uh, an early Latin author like uh, Ariugena, yes, exactly. he knows a lot of the Greek patristic authors, and he knows Dionysius and so on. Yes, exactly. We know, we have no Ariugena, at least in that same period. Again, as I said, only in late 13th century, we have translators who are capable of producing good quality translations word by word from the Latin into Greek. Can you say something to explain that? I, I mean, it seems kind of perverse in a way that the Greeks would have so little interest in this large culture, which they clearly know about. I mean, for example, um, they're worried about whether Charles the Great, Charlemagne, should be considered an emperor in the ninth century. It was not like they're unaware that there are major courts in the Latin-speaking realm. Is it just because they assume that if you're doing philosophy, then Greek is better than Latin because Plato and Aristotle wrote in Greek? Or what's, what's Part, the problem? Partly because of that. But you also have to think that the relationship between 
the Latin West and the Byzantine Empire were very tense at a certain moment. First, you have in 1054 the schism, so the churches separate. And then in 1204, you have the Latin invasion of Constantinople. So the Byzantine Empire had to move to Nicaea, whereas Constantinople gets occupied for 50 years by the Crusaders. And after that, the relationship between these two worlds becomes definitely compromised. And when they did get Latin texts in, as you said, rather late and very partially, how influential were they? For example, would they take something like On the Trinity by Augustine once they've got it? Is, does it become really influential? It, there is something which becomes influential and with respect to Augustine and his legacy. For example, they take the uh, Augustine series that the soul uh, is an image of the Trinity. So there are three faculties of the soul, uh, mens, notitia, amor, so mind or spirit, knowledge and love. And this is something which is absent in the Greek patristic tradition. And once they learn that from Augustine, you see major influential theologian using that the, uh, that, th that theory that the, the human soul is an image of the Trinity. What you mentioned before briefly that uh, he was also known for attacking various, what he considered to be heretical movements, and I assume you mean Pelagianism and exactly. Donatism as well. Yes, yes. Was that really an issue in Byzantium? Because of course no. it's a big deal in Latin tradition. No, they just knew the person, they just knew the name. It's a kind of doxography, so they have a list of people whom they should have considered as a wise men and theological authority, but they uh, had no knowledge, no actual knowledge of his work, of Augustine's work. And what about Aquinas? You mentioned that they were impressed that he knew Aristotle. So. Yeah, the case of Aquinas is even more interesting. Uh, it all happened around 1354. And there was this man called Demetrius Kidonis. He was a diplomat working at a Byzantine court. And he had to learn Latin because he was supposed to deal with uh, many Westerners, uh, like traders in particular, who were acting in Constantinople, uh, people from Genoa, Pisa, and, uh, and in general, the Latin West. So he met a monk, a Dominican monk in Constantinople, and he asked him to teach him Latin, and this monk gave him as a book of ex grammar exercise, Aquinas Summa Contra Gentiles. <laughs> and once he read it, he was astonished and said, wow, these people know Aristotle much better than us. And from that moment on, there is a full set of Byzantine theologians who support Thomas Aquinas' view, convert to Catholicism, and reject all earlier Byzantine theology as a kind of superstition, mysticism, and something which has nothing to do with the exercise of pure reason. Thomas Aquinas, for them, was a champion of rationalism against fideism. Oh, right. So, in effect, he becomes a kind of standard bearer for an alternative exactly. model of Christianity. Exactly. And this is a kind, is perceived as a kind of uh, dramatic split within the Byzantine uh, intellectual uh, culture. Because you have, you really have uh, a kind of war between supporters of Aquinas and supporters of the traditional way of doing theology, which rejected uh, syllogism, for example, or rejected the use of dialectics and so on. So it's very interesting because it's not just that they uh, were surprised of Aquinas' knowledge of Aristotle, but they actually thought that Aquinas could be useful for reinvent and think again theology. Okay, so now turning to the other direction, you said that the influence of the Latin West on the Greek East is very minimal. What about the influence of the Greek East on the Latin West? Obviously, we think of the recovery of Aristotle and Plato later on uh, at the beginning of the Renaissance as a major impact from the Greek sphere on the Latin sphere. But what about properly Byzantine authors? Were they at all influential in the Latin West? Yes, indeed. I mean, with respect, for example, to theologians, we have the tradition of John of Damascus, who was translated in the uh, 12th century. And with respect to philosopher, to more philosophical sources, we have the tradition of the Greek Byzantine commentators on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, a very important figure in this respect is the uh, leading scholar and bishop uh, Robert Grossetest. Grossetest had collected a wonderful and amazing Greek library. And uh, he, when you look at Grossetest, you have the impression that the Byzantine were not only relevant or important, essential, 
because of the transmission of the manuscript of Aristotle, but also because they provided Western readers with the looking glasses for reading Aristotle, for understanding Aristotle. Yeah, something I talked about in the episodes on Latin medieval philosophy is that they would have often been reading Aristotle with the commentaries of, of Arawis, for example. And the same thing is true with the ethics, right? Because they read Grosseteste's translation of the ethics along with Latin translations of Byzantine commentaries. Exactly. And when, by the way, when we say Byzantine commentators here, maybe we should say who we mean, because you don't, I guess you don't just mean late ancient commentators. No, no. So we're not talking about Philopnus and Simplicius. No, none of these late ancient commentators commented actually upon the Nicomachean Ethics, although we know for sure that it was part of the curriculum of study in late antiquity. What I mean is uh, uh, Byzantine scholars such as the Bishop of Nicaea, Eustratius, and uh, court commentator Michael of Ephesus, both these scholars were active between the end of 11th and the beginning of the 12th century. Yeah, I've touched on them in the podcast already. And one thing I've said about the commentary tradition in Byzantium in general is that there's a lot of continuity between late antiquity and the Byzantine commentary tradition, which means that we find a lot of Neoplatonic ideas in the commentaries written on Aristotle in Byzantium. But first of all, would you say that's fair? Yeah, that's true. Okay, that's so the, true. The listeners can take my word yeah, for it. Yeah, I mean, the Byzantine <laughs> were very interested in Aristotle logic, but also in other works. And especially with respect to these other works, they were looking and reading at Aristotle with the eye of Neoplatonism. You know, and why, by the way, why are they so interested in the ethics? I mean, why are, do they comment on the ethics when the late antique authors hadn't? That's a very difficult question to answer. My idea, which is also the idea on which most scholars agree, is that they, uh, these commentaries were produced after the request of a patron. In this case, a princess, the daughter of the emperor, who was so interested in Aristotelian philosophy and requested uh, this, the production of these commentaries. So she actually said, give me a commentary yes, exactly. in ethics. Because in this, this, the idea that maybe like the royal family would be interested in the application of philosophy to their way of life? Or? We still have no clear idea on this, but that's a very good uh, suggestion uh, because uh, there is no trace, for example, no evidence suggesting that the Nicomachean Ethics was thought at school. So it's very interesting that the first appearance of this work in Byzantium uh, with witnessed by the, the writing and composition of these commentaries, uh, actually is uh, takes place actually within the imperial court. Mm -hmm. And it's nice, by the way, an example of a woman who is influencing the history of philosophy. That's very important. I'd like to highlight that. Yeah. So the fact that these commentaries are fairly Neoplatonic in character, do you think that that pushed the Latin readers of the ethics in a more Neoplatonic direction? Yes, I think so, especially for what regards uh, Book 1 of the Nicomachean Ethics. As you know, in Book 1, Aristotle criticized Plato theories of forms, and uh, the Byzantine actually tried to defend Plato from Aristotle's allegation. And actually, this uh, attempt at defending uh, Plato is very successful among Western readers. They all uh, praise Eustratius of Nicaea for having defended successfully Plato because they were interesting in what Eustratius does is to say that uh, Plato's forms are thought in the divine mind, so, and um, which is something which uh, Latin supporters of exemplarism, for example, such as Thomas Aquinas and Albert the Great, find very, found very easy to accept. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should just explain that the reason this is relevant to the context of talking about the ethics is that there's a chapter in the first book of the ethics where Aristotle attacks the idea of the form of the good in Plato. Would they, both the Byzantines and the Latins who were influenced by them, would they have gone on and said, well, not only are there ideas in the mind of God, which are these Platonic exemplars, but also we can say that God himself is the form of the good? Yes, that's exactly what Eustratius does. He claims that uh, the good exists, the good with capital G, I would say, and that the good is God. That's why Bonaventure and Albert the Great, for example, to uh, fund Eustratius readers, will support his defense of Plato against Aristotle. Of course, 
it's an uh, unauthentic play to play. They would have never said that probably the forms were uh, content in the divine mind, but that's the way the illustrators read Plato through the looking glasses of the new Platonism again. Yeah. In fact, that goes all the way back to Philo of Alexandria, exactly. Finer and Augustine. So that's, a, you know, that's not a novel way of distorting Plato, even if it's a distortion. Um, and by the way, do they cite Eustratius by name? When they by talk name, about yes. And they cited him as the commentator, which sometimes uh, modern editor, editors of uh, medieval Latin works mistook for Averroes, yeah, because Averroes was the commentator par excellence, but in many cases, the commentator at stake is Eustrisus of Nicaea. Uh-huh. The, another thing that I associate with Neoplatonic readings of the ethics is that they tend to put a lot of emphasis on the end of the ethics, the tenth and final book, where Aristotle says, having told you all about virtue and the life of practical engagement and also friendship, I'm now going to tell you that the very best life is the life of theoretical contemplation. And of course, that fits very well into a Neoplatonic worldview where you're being encouraged to turn away from the physical world towards the intelligible world. To what extent did the Byzantine commentators embrace that and then pass that on to the Latins? They endorsed this approach. For example, Michael of Ephesus, the commentator on Book 10 of the Nicomachean Ethics, understands uh, Aristotle's emphasis on contemplative life as the supreme form of happiness in terms of the Platonic assimilation to God insofar as humanly possible. And Eustratius is very clear in that, in, in this respect, in books, in his commentary on book six of the Nicomachean Ethics. He says we have to turn away from passions and the material world and we have to look at the separate intelligible world which is a very anti-Aristotelian way of thinking at contemplative life. But again, uh, they were very interested in mixing Aristotle with the new Platonist, in particular Proclus. One thing that strikes me about this is that that highly intellectualist approach to philosophy and life as a whole, the idea that what we're trying to do is achieve intellectual perfection, that's also very strong in the Arabic tradition. So I suppose that the Latin readers would have just thought that both the Arabic authors and the Greek authors, both sets of commentators, were reading Aristotle the same way. That's exactly what happens. Uh, for example, Albert the Great, who is the first and probably most consequential reader of Eustratus of Nicaea, Michael of Ephesus, he claims in his commentary on Aristotle on the soul, he claims that uh, the Byzantine commentator on Nicomachean Ethics shares with the Arabic commentators the very same theory on human intellect as something which is participated and is a kind of uh, uh, trace of the supreme separate intellect. What about the philosophers who are seen as the most radical Aristotelians in the late 13th century, namely the so-called Latin Averroists like Boethius, Adesia, C.J. of Brabant? I mean, the fact that they're called Averroists, whatever, whether you think that's right or not, um, the fact that they're called that suggests that they were above all being influenced by the Arabic tradition. Were they also influenced by the Greek tradition at all? Uh, research shows that actually they were influenced by influenced by the Byzantine tradition, in particular by the Byzantine commentators on the Nicomachean Ethics. A recent study by Luca Bianchi demonstrated that Boethius of Dacia quotes only one from Averroes, and it's probably a third end quotation. Uh, on the other end, uh, there are many passages in Boethius of Dacia's work which are very close to what the Eustratius and Michael of Ephesus says on the uh, contemplation, contemplative life as a kind of conjunction with the intelligible world. So in this way, we can say that uh, even modern scholars are trying to reassess the category of Averism, uh, looking at alternative sources like the Byzantine commentators on the Nicomachean Ethics. It suggests that actually Latin Byzantines would be a more appropriate name for them than Latin Averroists. Uh, I don't know, we'll say. <laughs> this is surely also true for breaches of Dutch. A seizure is another kind of... Yeah, right, okay. What about as we move forward into the 14th century, after the supposed high point of scholasticism in the 13th century, but before the Renaissance with the famous infusion of ideas and Platonism from the Byzantine world. Are there authors in the 14th century who draw on the Byzantine textual tradition? No, no, not directly. But they all still uh, depend upon 
texts and sources which had been translated previously in 13th century. For example, every if you look at the commentaries tradition again on the Nicomachean Ethics, you can see that everyone cites Eustratius and Michael's uh, and Michael as if they were the only reliable authority. Of course, there is also Averis. Averis' middle commentary in the Nicomachean Ethics was translated into Latin, but it was less influential and consequential than the Byzantine commentaries in the Nicomachean Ethics. I see. So there's basically two waves of Byzantine influence on the Latin West, or maybe three, actually, because there's the original one with Eriugena when he translates Dionysius and Gregory of Nyssa and so on. And then there's the second wave where they come in along with Aristotle in the 12th and 13th century. And then there's nothing for a while. There's, there's no new texts. And then there's the Renaissance. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And um, now looking even further ahead okay. to the Renaissance, uh, obviously now this is a very big topic, the um, transmission of philosophy from the Byzantine world into the Renaissance. But do you want to just pick out a few things that you think are particularly worth knowing about that? Yes. Once again, the background of this whole uh, uh, movement, translation movement, was uh, an ideological one. It all started with the Council of Florence and Ferrara in the fourth decade of the 15th century. It was about uh, the filioque, so it was about discussing theological issues mostly. But that was uh, an occasion for uh, Western scholar to meet their Byzantine counterparts. And uh, that was the beginning of uh, uh, a very, very interesting uh, phase in the history of philosophy where Byzantine scholars were lecturing in uh, Western universities or in private circles, for example, in Florence on later in Padua. And they were in, actually in touch personally with people like Ficino and the like. So we have not only a kind of uh, passive transmission of text, but it was mutuated and uh, mediated by personal acquaintance between Byzantine and Western scholars. And that's the most interesting thing. Sometimes Western scholars were asking their Byzantine colleague to translate or to support their understanding of uh, Greek uh, classical philosophical works. That is to say, we have an example of uh, intellectual collaboration between intellectuals from different worlds. Just like in the 12th century, when in Spain you have Christians working together with Jews exactly. or, uh, or Muslims who are native speakers of Arabic, and they collaborate on Arabic Latin translations. Yes. Right. That's interesting because I, I think um, a lot of people probably would have thought that what happens in the Renaissance is that a bunch of people who are Latin-speaking Christians in Italy learn Greek. And somehow they get their hands on a bunch of Greek manuscripts and then they're off and running and the Renaissance happens. But you're saying that it's actually at least partially about movement of people from the Byzantine East to the Latin West. And when Constantinople fell to the Turkish in 1453, even more Byzantine emigre escaping from Constantinople where became refugees in Italy. And think that the Aristotle edition prepared by Aldus Manuncius in Venice, they were all prepared by Greek collaborators of his, like Marco Musurus. So the basic standard edition for centuries of Aristotle was prepared by Greek emigres in, in Italy. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, that's a perfect note on which to end because I am ending my look at the Byzantine tradition with the fall of Constantinople. And now I'm going to be turning it to look at the Renaissance philosophical tradition. So I'll thank Michele Trizio very much for coming thank on you, the podcast Peter. to conclude our look at Byzantine philosophy. And please join me next time as we start to look at Renaissance philosophy here on the History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. Oh,